I'd like to thank game publisher PCube for sending me review codes for the PC version of Class of Heroes 1 and 2 Complete Edition for free to do a meaty double feature review here on my channel. For anybody interested in a particular game in this collection, I've put timestamps in the description below, but I'll be referencing Class of Heroes 1 a lot in my Class of Heroes 2 review since that game inherits many of the features of the first game. The original Class of Heroes, developed by Zero Div and published by Acquire in Japan, was first released in the West on the PSP in 2009. The version of Class of Heroes in this collection that I'll be reviewing is the enhanced remake of the game Class of Heroes Anniversary Edition that was originally released on the Nintendo Switch in Japan in 2018. Right off the bat, if you're familiar with Wizardry, you'll already be familiar with the style of game Class of Heroes is, as it inherits many of its features from Wizardry. Fun fact, Class of Heroes was popular enough in Japan for Zero Div to obtain the rights to actually create their own official Wizardry game, Wizardry Labyrinth of Lost Souls. Anyways, the game begins with your homeroom teacher introducing herself in a very short school entrance ceremony. The game gives you permission to explore two areas, but First, you need to form a party at the school's office. If you're confused about the game, I can actually recommend visiting the game's gallery on the title screen and reading the fun comics in the gallery that also teach you how to play the game. You can use a preset group of characters created by the game or create your own characters to the game's character creation system. As everything is school-themed, this is called enrolling in the game. Enrolling your own characters allows you to customize the name, gender, race, alignment, and course of the new character. The course is equivalent to the character's class in an RPG or a wizardry game. You can re-roll your your enrollment to get different amounts of bonus points to add to your character's stats depending on how patient you are. However, inflating your stats can also lead to losing stats and level up, so my advice to anybody playing this game is not to try too hard to twink your characters. I personally made it through the game with half my party using 8 to 10 bonus points and the other half using close to 20. I noticed no difference in the performance of my characters based on stat distributions alone, and by the end of my playthrough their stats were more or less rounded out. Your party composition is the most important thing to get right when you play this game, and it's not a straightforward as it may appear to be. That's largely due to the game's affinity system, which can help you or hurt you. Your party's initial affinity depends on the race and alignment of its members. The game also kind of annoyingly hides the specific numbers for how different races and alignments affect your affinity. Low affinity will not only negatively and noticeably affect your party members' stats later in the game, it will also make performing powerful party skills more difficult too. Fortunately, on the status page of any character you can see a percentage for the character's affinity with their current party. Your characters will also naturally gain affinity with each other by using party skills in combat through regular gameplay if you use them together often in the labyrinths. Later in the game, there are accessories you can put on party members to neutralize the negative effects of affinity too. It's very easy to enroll and expel or replace party members early on to see how the different races and alignments affect each other's affinity before even setting foot in a dungeon. I don't know what is considered bad affinity as far as percentages go, but I aim to have the majority of my party close to 100% affinity with nobody going below 88%. Aside from affinity, the other important component of your characters is their actual course. The course is the wizardry equivalent of a character's class in this game. I'll be using the words course and class interchangeably, but they mean the same thing in this game. In order to select the course, the character's stats and alignment need to be compatible with the course. This game doesn't restrict you to basic classes at the beginning of the game, and if you create a character with a lot of bonus points, it is possible to begin at level 1 as a class with heavy stat requirements. However, just because a class requires more stats doesn't necessarily mean it will be a great starting choice for a character, so create your party responsibly. Depending on your party makeup, it might be better to level up your characters in basic fundamental classes until they've learned some useful spells or obtained some powerful weapons exclusive to the more advanced classes first. You can change classes at any time which will retain a character's stats, 50% of their max hit points, and the spells that they've learned but reset their level to 1. This lets you customize your characters to some extent and allow them to fill more roles if necessary. The good thing about this game's class system is that it's not restricted to race or gender, and there are ways to change your alignment in the game so any race can be any class. There are definitely some races that are more inclined to certain classes though. The game also tells you the specific stat and alignment requirements to become a class, so you can plan according if any alignment requirements might create affinity issues. One other important thing to mention about race is that some races have unique features. For example, the Bahamun and Diabolos races can breathe to deal damage to enemies in a group. This breath attack increases its effectiveness with level and can be used to deal non-physical damage to physical resistant enemies, which makes it very useful. Each course has its own skills that characters can learn at specific levels and can be seen on their status screen. Magic classes will also learn useful spells as they level up. Magic is handled in classic wizardry style with spells 
spell is being divided into seven tiers. As characters level up, they'll learn up to four spells in each tier before moving on to the next one to learn spells in the new tier. In addition to new spells, characters will also be able to use the spells they've learned more times as they level up, maxing out at being able to cast a spell nine times for each tier. Your party in this game has three front slots and three back slots. Characters in the back slots will be more difficult for enemies to target than characters in the front, but they'll need to use magic or longer ranged weapons to deal damage to enemies. Characters in the front row will eat most of the hits, but they can easily deal damage with powerful melee weapons. Aside from party management, this game is very straightforward. The game's hub, Particus Campus, features facilities that will aid you in your dungeon crawling. The dormitory provides a place to recover your party for their next journey or change your party around. If any characters were knocked out, became unusable, or need to remove a status ailment, it can be done at the infirmary for a fee. You can also donate gold to give a party member experience points. The office is where you can manage your party. The laboratory lets you do alchemy to create new items and equipment for your party, which I'll talk about in a bit. The campus store is where you can purchase things for your party, remove cursed items, and identify items. The library is where you can view various things about your playthrough and includes maps, a monster catalog, and items catalog. The bulletin board is also where you can pick up quests which are required to complete the game. The game's alchemy system can be accessed in two ways. The cheap way is to have a party member as an alchemist and have them create items for free for you. However, unless you level them up, they'll quickly reach a point where their level isn't high enough to do useful alchemy for you anymore. The expensive way is to use the laboratory to do alchemy. You can try to guess alchemy recipes or use a guide online, but the easiest way to unlock alchemy recipes is to simply buy them from the campus store. In addition to creating new items from broken ones and materials, you can also level up items using alchemy and dismantle items into their component parts. Upgrading is well worth doing, as even the low-level equipment can be cheaply upgraded to take you to the end of the game if you add up to nine levels of defense onto it. The majority of items you find in the labyrinths will be unidentified, and you can either pay the campus store to identify these items, or you can have a bishop or five like me in your party to identify items for free. Like alchemists, they'll eventually reach a point where it's difficult difficult to identify high-level items, but even a team of level 1 bishops worked well enough for me to get to the credits screen of this game. The labyrinths themselves are mostly randomly generated from subsets of maps for the specific labyrinths you're exploring. This means you'll see some overlap in maps as you explore different labyrinths, with the most complicated maps being reserved for the labyrinths that are furthest from Particus. The labyrinths have no shortage of tricky sections that will force you to use your spells, items, and especially the maps you can purchase at the different stores you'll visit between labyrinths. If you're serious about completing all of the maps in this game, be ready to constantly go into your menu to select your store-bought maps because they give you a lot more information than the map spells and the select button will ever give you for the map overlay. To progress in Class of Heroes, you need to accept quests from the bulletin board in the library and then speak with the NPCs in the different locations specified in the quest information, usually beginning with an NPC at one of the locations in the hub to begin the quests. The game doesn't distinguish between main quests and side quests, but later on you'll definitely be able to distinguish them. Some quests will give specific coordinates, but many will require you to explore the labyrinths. The story in this game is fairly minimal, and it exists mostly to steer the dungeon crawling gameplay. I played Class of Heroes for 40 and a half hours on normal difficulty until I saw the credit screen, but there's also a fair amount of post-game content I did not engage with. I actually had a lot of fun with this game, but there were a lot of things I didn't like and I think will bother a lot of people, which I'll talk about first. To get the most out of this game, you'll need to do a ton of menuing. It took me a few hours of trial and error just to make a party I was happy with, and a lot of that time was devoted to creating, expelling, and recreating different characters to see how they affected the affinity of my party. This was before even going into a dungeon for the first time. I actually find the process of designing a party for these kinds of games a lot of fun, so this wasn't a huge deal, but I do wish the game was more transparent about its alignment system, which I ended up referring to online guides for. The menuing doesn't stop there. Since most of what you find in this game is unidentified, you'll have to go through menus to identify all those items too. This isn't a huge deal if you have a ton of gold and can quickly do it at the campus store with no chance of failure, but since gold is hard to come by, I ended up creating a party of one alchemist and five bishops strictly to save myself money. The problem with using low-level bishops to identify everything is that they get status ailments that prevent them from identifying sometimes when they fail, which requires even more menuing to fix through spells or the infirmary. Alchemy is even worse with the menus. The game won't automatically show you recipes for your items. You have to manually find the recipes or guess them and then select those specific items in a whole other menu. While identifying items isn't extraordinarily expensive, alchemy is. And if you want to save yourself time, you'll also want to buy the alchemy recipes at the stores so you can easily reference them in the game. I personally ended up using old guides online, but this is something that will definitely frustrate anybody who has gotten used to all the UI features developers have put in recent RPGs to save players time. Most of the time, I just made do with what I found and identified and just didn't bother engaging with the game's alchemy system and I was still able to beat the game. 
game. The dungeon design in this game feels a lot like this was the level designer's first time designing dungeons for a dungeon crawler. There's a ton of mirrored dungeon designs, with 50% of the map being a reflection of the other half, which feels lazy to me. The puzzles created by traps and dungeon features are also very repetitive. I won't spoil all of them, but I have to mention the most annoying one that affected my enjoyment of this game. I was thoroughly sick of dark rooms with twisty panels that change your direction facing while hiding your on-screen map. And the solution to this puzzle is always the same. You have to go into a series of menus to manually check your paper map to figure out which way you're facing and then calculate how many turns you need to make to figure out where to go since only the paper map will show you which direction you're facing. This requires a lot of menuing just to navigate one square and what's often a chain of these same squares to reach a magic key or the way to the next floor. Your inventory will also very quickly fill with items that may or may not be garbage thanks to the fact that they're unidentified. In this game, you actually have a lot of inventories to potentially manage. Each character in your party has their own inventory and can hold their own amount of gold. There is also party storage to hold some items as you're traveling. Different parties you create also have their own party storage. In addition, each academy has their own storage too that can be accessed in the dorms. So if you're going to identify items with a different party, you need to move everyone's inventory of unidentified items into the dorm storage and then bring out your identification party to take those items out of the dorm storage so they can actually identify them. There's also no easy way to transfer gold between parties. I did mention I spent several hours creating a decent party in this game, and because of that I didn't find anything other than maybe a handful of encounters too challenging. And these were towards the end of the game. The only grinding I had to do was at the very beginning to learn a few fundamental spells and gain some leverage over the early enemies in the tutorial labyrinth. Around level 5, I had found some decent equipment and I was able to proceed through the quests at a comfortable pace. That said, the game balance is wonky for lack of a better term, at least for me playing on normal. I found most boss fights in this game end very quickly, and sometimes you can actually use your combined attacks to finish off the bosses before they can even do anything, which was often the case for me. However, if bosses get a chance to act, get Get ready for wipes, especially in the more difficult dungeons. Since you can save the game everywhere, it's not a huge problem since you can usually see when you're about to fight a boss and you can just save the game and reload if things go sour. Many times you can try again and the boss's stats reroll to be lower and you can one-shot them. The final boss of this game is especially obnoxious and a huge jump in difficulty, but I did enjoy adjusting my party's equipment around it and finally beating it. There were a few regular encounters that caught me off guard and I had to be careful with too. It's important to note there is an easy and hard difficulty option for this game too. Since your beginning equipment has no defense value, it's important to replace it with equipment that does have defense value as soon as possible. Different classes have different default accuracy values too, which is important to monitor and increase with equipment for the more physical damage focused classes. While you can find great equipment in this game, upgrading it is also very powerful, and you can cheaply upgrade low level equipment to be on par with much stronger equipment early on. In fact, most of my armor at the end of the game was found in the early dungeons and upgraded as I got the financial and material resources to do so. The newer, better armor couldn't compete with the upgraded defense values on my older armor and would have cost a lot more money to upgrade. I imagine I would need much better upgraded equipment for the post game though if I wanted to do that. World traversal becomes fast when you've unlocked the shortcuts on the maps. You can use your map items to automatically run to previously visited areas of maps once you've explored them too. There are items you can buy if you don't have spells that will let you teleport or even travel directly to locations on the game's world map. There are also hubs between the labyrinths that offer rest spots, shops, and sometimes even new quest locations. Speaking of quests, they're generally pretty easy to do, but most of the time you'll be wandering around labyrinths looking for the actual quest locations as the game doesn't always give you specific labyrinth coordinates. They do give you some general direction, but even one floor of a labyrinth can cover a pretty wide area. The complex maps take a lot more time to explore, too. I've been very critical, but there are some things I really enjoyed about this game that fortunately make up the better part of actually playing the game. The turn-based combat, once you've got your party going, is very fast and fluid, which is important because the game's encounter rate can be pretty high sometimes. Times. It's also satisfying seeing your party develop as they learn amazing spells and skills that make the game much easier to handle. While I stuck with a very standard party of mostly basic classes that I didn't bother reclassing at all, I know the other classes are very viable too according to your style of play. And reclassing with the extra hit points or spells at level 1 probably makes the game much easier for anybody struggling with the difficulty. It's pretty easy to create new teams of explorers too, or utility parties designed to identify or alchemize items. 
Clearing the maps in this game is pretty satisfying too, since it means you can quickly travel through them if you encounter them in a future labyrinth. The updated graphics compared to the original PSP version are nice, and I personally love the anime aesthetics in the game. The music's a bop too, and you can even completely customize where songs play in the game in the game's settings menu. The gallery is also fun to look at, as it has a lot of art and comics to teach you about the game. While I complained a fair bit about all the time-consuming menuing, there are some neat time and money-saving tricks to discover too. Class of Heroes also has a neat reincarnation system for hardcore players that lets you increase your max stat caps on characters. But none of my characters reach levels even half as high as what's necessary to actually reincarnate, nor needed to, to beat the main game. The fact that there's a post-game content after beating the game is always nice and adds value to the product. Overall, I'd say Class of Heroes feels like a game made in 2009. It doesn't have a lot of the great usability features that we've grown used to in 2024, and it definitely doesn't respect your time. The story gets the job done, but probably won't be too memorable. There's a fun character and party creation system in there with a heavy influence from wizardry, and many tons of hours of content in there to get lost in and do quests for anybody interested in playing the game. Compared to other dungeon crawlers I've enjoyed, like Etrian Odyssey and Stranger of Sword City, this game isn't quite as memorable to me. I enjoyed the game a lot as someone with a much bigger interest in traditional JRPGs than classic style dungeon crawlers, but it would still be hard for me to recommend it to anybody but huge fans of dungeon crawlers who don't mind spending time in a more middling experience. I'd say if you are able to enjoy older dungeon crawlers, and especially wizardry, there's a good chance you could enjoy Class of Heroes as well. I just wouldn't expect too much from the game. Class of Heroes 2 was originally developed by Zero Div and published by Acquire, like the first game, but it didn't get a Western release until 2013 on the PSP. This original game and its enhanced port, Class of Heroes 2G, released on the PS3, are famous for having only a few thousand physical copies ever made, with its availability mostly being digital on PlayStation's PSN service. The remastered version of Class of Heroes 2 in this collection that I will be reviewing is based off of the enhanced Class of Heroes 2G port on the PS3 that Acquire originally published in 2010. The game is a sequel to the original Class of Heroes, but can easily be enjoyed without having played the first game. You begin Class of Heroes 2 with your new classmate introducing herself, and you meet several other main characters in the game. Similar to the first game, you need to form a party in the office to proceed. Right off the bat, you can use the default party members made available at the beginning or create your own party. Enrolling new students in class Class of Heroes 2 is very similar to how it works in the original Class of Heroes with a few key differences. The first is that classes are restricted to race in Class of Heroes 2, which can make planning your party even more challenging than it was in the original game. The game also no longer tells you what your stat numbers or alignments need to be to change to a specific class, which is pretty annoying and I ended up just referring to a guide online for the details I needed to plan a party. The affinity system, stats, bonus points, special race characteristics, and everything else about the character creation system are pretty much like they were in the first game. Bonus points can be rerolled too. While the game won't give you precise affinity numbers, it can still be checked on the status page like in the first game. Each race has at least one class that only that race can become, and some of the better class choices have also been divided between two other academies you'll visit later in the game, so you have to work to access some of the more advanced physical and magical classes. The old wizardry style spell tiers and usage numbers have been replaced by the more popular JRPG style of spells in a list with magic points used to cast them. This is one of my favorite changes to the game compared to the first one, and it makes using magic a lot more fun since I don't have to worry about the amount of certain spells I can use. Reclassing is almost exactly the same as in the first game, except you aren't limited to only four spells per tier now, which usually required you to forget spells spells in the first game to learn new ones. So you can literally just collect all the spells from all the available classes a race has access to. Reclassing still brings characters back to level 1 with half of the hit points they had before the reclass. But it's very powerful, and most of my party went through one reclass in this game, with one party member going through two. Class of Heroes 2 presents its story in a more detailed manner than the first game, and the characters are well voiced in Japanese. However, it is important to note that there are no English voiceover options in this game, and that could bother some people. The game's story is a fun mix of of silliness and drama. At the very least, it's a lot more interesting than the first game's very minimalistic story, but still nothing too memorable. There are a lot of love stories in this game, in general, among the different NPCs. The kinds of springtime of youth love stories typical of school dramas and anime. While we're on the topic of voices, voice audio volume is unadjustable and really loud. It's especially noticeable when you lower the BGM and sound effects volume in the settings menu. There's also no option to completely configure BGMs to situations like you could in the original Class of Heroes, but the BGM in Class of Heroes 2 is pretty good the way it is in my opinion. 
Like the first game, you'll largely proceed through this story by accepting important quests through the bulletin board at the library and doing them. The library also has all the same features it did in the original game, letting you see enemy data, map data, item data, and showing you your play statistics. The office, infirmary, laboratory, and dormitory all have the same functions as the first game. This game thankfully got rid of unidentified items, which cuts down on menuing significantly, but alchemy hasn't changed at all. The prices for alchemy are a lot more reasonable though, and I was actually able to enjoy using the mechanic without feeling like I had to level up an alchemy alchemist, which is a big plus from me. As a side note though, the rebalanced alchemist in this game is better than the alchemist in the first game as far as a usable class goes. The level design for the labyrinths is so much better in this game than the first one. The mirrored maps, gloomy dungeons, and square grids have been replaced by many open exterior paths with a variety of shapes. The gloomy square dungeons do exist, but they at least aren't heavily mirrored and are sparse enough to feel interesting when you reach them. The variety of explorable environments is very much welcome. The annoying pervasive things I complained about with the first game are dialed down to instances I can count on one hand and actually felt interesting since they weren't overused in this game. The labyrinth gimmicks are much more spread out and arranged more interestingly. Zero Div's dungeon design definitely improved for this game and I found myself looking forward to exploring new areas much more since the maps were more intelligently designed rather than mirrored squares. My only real complaint with the labyrinths is that the quest system requires you to traverse these same labyrinths over and over again to get to further dungeons to do quests. It's not uncommon to finish a quest in a location, only to return all the way back to the library and end up unlocking a few more quests in the same faraway location. I garrisoned a party in most quest-giving locations just to alleviate some of this constant retreading of old ground, but many times completing a quest will kick you back to the Crostini Academy anyways. Like the first game, some quests will give you specific coordinates for where to do them, but most quests put you on a wild goose chase in the labyrinth searching for event squares, which I am not a fan of. My least favorite of these were quests in the Witch's Forest, which is one of the largest labyrinths in the game. I ended up using a Japanese wiki that gave me the coordinates to save myself a lot of time on these quests. You can hold 100 items now, so while your inventory will still fill up with garbage, it's a lot more manageable. The fact that you don't have to identify all those items also makes it easy to discard the junk if necessary. I love that all your characters and parties now share the same inventory and gold in this game. This saves so much time in inventory management compared to the first game, since you can simply have garrison parties manage your inventories from across the world. I played Class of Heroes 2 for 50 hours on Maniac Save Mode to the end of the main game, but there's plenty of post-game content too. Maniac Save Mode apparently auto-saves at much more scant intervals, but I read somewhere it improves the item drop, so that's why I chose to play it. I didn't even realize that the game autosaves, because I became so accustomed to creating manual saves as I was playing. There was still some initial grinding in the first area to establish some dominance over the weaker enemies, but after that, the difficulty curve of Class of Heroes 2 was much smoother than Class of Heroes. Some boss fights in the easier side quests could still end with one powerful party attack, but many times there was an exchange of blows and I'd lose some party members during the exchange. Many labyrinths are peppered with a few very powerful regular enemies too that can wipe you if you're not careful. There weren't any weird one-sided RNG wipes like in the first game when I played, but I could have just been lucky too. The only change I didn't like from the first game is not being able to see the specific stat and alignment requirements for class changes. I still wish affinity fickleness was more transparent, and alchemy is a fun concept, but it's still annoying how long it takes to actually research ingredient requirements and craft something. I did find one bug in the game at the dormitory of the academy past the witch's wood. The storage option is labeled as rest and takes you to the dormitory storage menu. The resting option is labeled as Organize and lets you rest. The Organize option is labeled as Report and lets you organize your party. There's a good chance this could be fixed before the game's released, and it's not a huge issue, but I wanted to mention it here just in case. Overall, Class of Heroes 2 is a much better game than the first one. The classes are designed much better. For example, even novice classes can learn a set of useful fundamental spells even if they'll never be as good as mages at casting them. The fact that you have to work to obtain some of the better classes encourages a little more experimentation with reclassing later in the game. Like Class of Heroes, I don't think reclassing is all that necessary, but it's very satisfying when you create utility characters that can buff, safely open chests, and deal high physical damage even in the back row. Or when you reclass magic users to learn all the useful spells you need. Some classes provide value right out of the gate at level 1, and others are late bloomers, but all the ones I used were fun, balanced, and functional when appropriately leveled up. Class of Heroes 2 is an easier game to recommend to more casual fans of dungeon crawlers than the first game. It's still got its awkward quirks when it comes to character creation and classes, but the revamp 
Adapt magic system, improved level design, and story improvements make it more fun to play. Alchemy still requires a lot of menuing, but you won't find yourself constantly using item maps, identifying items, or refreshing buffs due to a ridiculous amount of anti-magic floors and dark rooms. The magic system is just logical and familiar to anybody who's played JRPGs. And while the game is a sequel to the original game, you can enjoy it without having played the first game. Still, I wouldn't expect too much from this game. You'll still wander around aimlessly looking for quest objectives, and the alchemy system can still be as frustrating as it is rewarding to use. In the PC version of the games, you can adjust the graphics in windowed mode up to 1440p, and there's an option for full screen for both games. I already talked about how the voiceover dialogue volume is not adjustable, but there are audio settings for BGM, sound effects, and ambient sounds. I played through both games with an Xbox controller, but Class of Heroes lets you customize keyboard settings to play the game on keyboard. I didn't see an option to customize keyboard settings for Class of Heroes 2, but I did play Class of Heroes 2 with the keyboard for a few minutes and I was able to do everything I wanted on the keyboard. Neither game let me use the mouse. I don't see prices for the PC version of Class of Heroes 1 and 2 Complete Edition as of the time I'm posting this video, but the physical copy of the game is selling for $40 on Switch. I think it's a fair price for both of these games given their age and making these games available on modern platforms is only a good thing in my opinion. Having put 90 hours into the games, I obviously enjoyed my time with them enough to want to play the third game. This is definitely a niche series for fans of dungeon crawler RPGs though. While this release is being called a complete edition, there is a class of Heroes 3 that has never been localized for the West. Personally, I'd love to see these games succeed so that we might finally see Class of Heroes 3 come West if that game ever gets remastered like these games have, as I saw a good word of mouth from Japanese players when I was surfing Japanese wikis for information on Class of Heroes. Class of Heroes 1 and 2 Complete Edition will release on April 26, 2024 on PlayStation 5, Switch, and Steam. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.